Okay, so this little lecture is going to be on the skull and the sinuses. This is going to be somewhat of a review type thing, but it's also going to be informative. Okay, so let's start out with the bovine. I want you to identify for me the process at A. Yes, this is the corneal process. Remember, corneal refers to horn. Process A is an extension of which bone? That's right, it's the frontal bones. So remember in the bovine, that frontal bone extends all the way back here caudally so that the parietal bones are pushed down ventrally. Okay, so now identify the opening at B. That's right, it's above the orbit, and so that is the supraorbital foramen. What passes through B? Remember, in the bovine, it's going to be the frontal vein. However, in the equine, it's going to be the supraorbital artery and nerve. Okay, now. Identify the bone at A. Yes, even though there are no incisors, that is the incisive bone. Identify the bone at B. Yep, that is the nasal bone. The bone at C then is the maxillary bone. Once again at D we see the frontal bone. At E, near the medial canthus of the eye, is going to be the lacrimal bone. Yep. Okay, the bone at F. The major portion of our zygomatic arch is the zygomatic bone. The bone at G, which also includes this portion of the arch here, is the temporal bone. Now at H, this is where we see the parietal bone, that's right. Okay, then at I, so where we have some of the sphenoid bone, and at J we see some of the palatine bone. Okay. So still with the bovine here, Identify the bone at A. It's going to be the base of the hyoid, so it's the basihyoid. Coming off of that is going to be the serratohyoid. And then we have the epihyoid. And finally we have the long stylohyoid. Okay, remember all of those go in alphabetical order. Basihyoid, serratohyoid, epihyoid, and stylohyoid. Okay. The structure at E, this bone is the, it's going over to the thyroid cartilage, so this is the thyrohyoid bone. Which of these bones is much reduced in the equine? That's right, it is, it is the epihyoid. Remember, with the equine, the epihyoid is just the cartilage right here between the serratohyoid and the stylohyoid. Okay. Okay, identify this ridge or line at A. This is the temporal line, sometimes called the frontal crest. Just ventral to that is where you can palpate the corneal artery as well as nerve. This is where you would block for dehorning. Okay, so this depression here at B is the... That's right, that's the temporal fossa. Remember that temporal line and the temporal fossa, those are named for the temporalis muscle, not for the bone. Okay, structure C, 
I'm talking about this whole structure here. That's right, that's the zygomatic arch. Structure D is the facial tuberosity. That's right. And if you go just a little bit dorsal and rostral to that is the foramen, which is the infraorbital foramen. Yep. Okay, now we have a notch at F, which is between the incisive and the nasal bone. So let's call this the nasoincisive notch. Okay. Okay, this foramen down here, actually there's a couple down here in the mandible. This is the mental foramen. I like to think of the statue of the thinker. He had his chin on his hand, so the chin, mental, well, you get the picture. Okay, now back here at H we find the occipital condyle and adjacent to the condyle is going to be the pericondylar process. Yep. Okay, we're looking at the caudal aspect of a bovine skull. This bone back here would then be the occipital bone. In orange we see the that's right, the frontal bone. The bone in red here is the parietal bone. In between these, because it's between the parietal bones, it's the interparietal bone. The bone in blue here is going to then be the temporal bone. Okay. Now the structure at A, so this is in the caudal aspect of the skull, dorsally, and if this animal was not pulled, if it did have horns, then it would make sense that this is the intercorneal protuberance. Okay, it seems to be more prominent in pulled breeds, but it is still present in non-pulled breeds. Okay. And then B, even though it's not dorsocaudal like it is in the horse, this is the, that's right, the external occipital protuberance. Okay. That's where the nuchal ligament is going to be attached, at least that funicular portion. Okay. Here we got a horned breed once again. So the sinuses have all been sculpted out so you can see them. So this blue region here would be the, yep, that's the caudal portion of the frontal sinus. And so this portion must be the rostral portion. Okay. Generally the rostral portion has about two or three compartments and each of them opens separately into the ethmoidal meatus. Okay, so it opens right into the nasal cavity. The caudal frontal sinus is much larger, more clinically significant. It also opens into the ethmoid meatus. Okay, now identify the specific portion here of this sinus. So the sinus is extending up into the corneal process here as the that's right the corneal diverticulum this is something to keep in mind because if you dehorn an adult animal and you cut through that you are going to then open up the frontal sinus okay generally dehorning is going to occur in the very young before the horn buds actually attach and often they'll freeze those and that will take care of it. So now let's identify the specific portion of the sinus at B. Okay, this is the nuchal diverticulum. 
and then the specific portion at C because it is behind the orbit is the post-orbital diverticulum. Okay? Now the surgical limits are the frontal sinus. The caudal limit is going to be the base of the skull. The lateral limit is about the temporal line with a little deviation into the zygomatic process. The rostral limit being the rostral border of the orbit. Okay, here I'm showing some dots where trephining takes place. This is where you actually you drill through the skull into the sinus for drainage. Okay, you want to be careful when you do that that you are not hitting the superorbital foramen and the vein coming out of it. Okay, you also want to make sure you don't get too close to the center because we don't want to hit the brain. Okay, so the specific landmarks from that you can learn at a later time. Okay, surgical limits of the maxillary sinus. So we want to use the rostral border of the orbit for our caudalmost limit. The rostral limit is going to be the facial tuberosity. The dorsal limit is a line from the medial angle of the eye to the inferior orbital foramen. And then our ventral limit is going to be a line from the zygomatic arch to the facial tuberosity. Remember we communicate with the nasal cavity via the nasal maxillary opening. Infections in the bovine maxillary sinus are uncommon. Generally if you do have a problem you're going to find above and caudal to the facial tuberosity such as right there. Okay. Let's look at the ventral surface of the skull now. And I ask you to identify the thin bony structure at A. In many of our specimens, these have been broken out. Because what this is, this is an extension of the maxillary sinus caudally into the ventral part of the orbit in what is known as the lacrimobola. Okay. This pokey structure here at B, what is this? This is the muscular process, and muscles that are within the soft palate are attached to that muscular process. Now C, even though it doesn't look very bulla-like, this is the tympanic bulla. And then at D, we have this little structure that kind of sits tucked down in sometimes. It's kind of circular. That's going to be the styloid process. Okay. Now let me point out that in the bovine, there is no mastoid process because the petrous temporal bone is not exposed externally. But if it were, it would be somewhere about in here. And so then when we identify the foramen at E, we can be sure that this is the stylomastoid foramen. Okay. Once again, structure F is a process adjacent to the condyles, and so that is the pericondylar process, and I just gave away what G is, which is the occipital condyle. Okay, let's look back up a little more rostrally, and then we've got these openings here. Basically, these are openings going from the nasal cavity into the nasal pharynx. And so by definition, you should know this as the cone. Okay? Now here, I've kind of tilted up the caudal aspect of the skull here so that we can see the foramina. And the foramina at A is the optic foramen. What passes through that? That's right, it is the optic nerve. Now we have a great big foramen at B. Okay, 
Now it's important to remember that this foramina at B is a combination of the orbital fissure and the round foramen. Okay? And so that will help you know that this is the foramen orbital rotundum. So coming through the orbital fissure, we know that the oculomotor nerve 3, trochlear nerve 4, and the ophthalmic nerve 5 are going to come through that, as well as the abducens nerve 6. So all these nerves that are going to the periorbital structures, okay, but also because we have the addition of the round frame and into that, hence orbital rotundum, it's also going to include the maxillary nerve of 5. Okay? Okay, then the opening at C, because we don't have a alar canal here, the opening at C, it's oval, it's the oval foramen. You remember what passes through that oval foramen? That's right, that's the mandibular nerve. Okay, let's look at an equine in that same area. Okay, so we have that A, that little guy's the ethmoidal foramen. You're not so needing to remember that, but it's a good one to eliminate that that little guy is not one we're worrying about. So the next one is the optic frame. Okay. Then we have the larger orbital fissure. What passes through the orbital fissure? That's right, just as we said before, oculomotor nerve, trochlear nerve, and abducens nerve, as well as the ophthalmic of the trigeminal nerve. Okay, so we see there's a thin plate between the orbital fissure and the rostral alar foramen, or the what are, what's sometimes referred to as just the round foramen. Okay, so and transmitting through that is the maxillary nerve. Okay. So now identify the opening up here at D. That's right, that's a superorbital foramen. And what passes through this? That's right, the superorbital artery and nerve. Okay, a more ventral view, kind of a ventral lateral view. We can see this bony structure here. Let me outline that for you right there. That is the pericondylar process. That's right. You see just over here, we see this in pink, kind of round, almost cylindrical shape sometimes. And sometimes there's more bony proliferation surrounding it, so it's kind of buried deep. This would be the styloid process. This is where the stylohyoid bone attaches. Okay. And back here at C, this is actually part of the petrous temporal bone sticking through. And so, yeah, this is the mastoid process. And then the foramen between the styloid process and the mastoid process is the, that's right, stylomastoid foramen. Okay. This great big fissure that almost looks like a laceration in the bone. Yes, this is foramen lacerum. Okay. Over here on the zygomatic arch, we have a depression here. This is the, that's right, the mandibular fossa. Okay. The opening over here at G is the hypoglossal foramen. Okay, we're going to have a more ventral look on this now. So the opening at A once again is the foramen lacerum. And what passes through that? That's right, a loop of the internal carotid artery. Now we've got a specific little notch right here. And this little notch is the oval notch. That's right. So instead of having an oval foramen, it's been kind of incorporated into this here. So this oval notch contains the 
mandibular nerve, right? Okay, then back here more caudally at C. We see another notch. This is the jugular notch. That's right. And what's going to pass through the jugular notch? Think of all the things that pass through the jugular foramen. Okay, that's right. The glossopharyngeal, the vagus, and the accessory nerves. Okay. Now, surgical limits, caudal limit here is going to be a zygomatic process of the frontal bone. The rostral limit is going to be halfway between the orbit and the infraorbital foramen. The medial limit is going to be about two centimeters from the midline. And the lateral limit is going to be a line drawn from the supraorbital foramen to the most rostral portion of the median. Okay. So we have noticed that the more rostral portion is continuous with the rostral dorsal conchal sinus. So often this whole sinus is referred to as the conchal frontal sinus. Okay, so yes, we sometimes need to do trefining in a horse. Okay, so difference in the horse is that this frontal sinus does not communicate directly with the nasal cavity. And so fortunately it does communicate with the maxillary sinus. Okay, and so here in this image we can see the frontal maxillary opening. So anything that is in the frontal sinus must pass through the frontal maxillary opening into the maxillary sinus to reach the nasal cavity. Okay, once again, surgical limits. So the caudal limit is going to be the rostral portion of the orbit. Rostral limit is going to be the rostral end of the facial crest up to the infraorbital foramen. We're going to use the facial crest for the ventral limit. And then if we draw a line from the infraorbital foramen parallel to that facial crest, we'll have the dorsal limit. Okay. Notice we do have a division here. Dividing it into a, a rostral and a caudal compartment. Okay, the caudal compartment is the one that communicates with the frontal sinus via the frontal maxillary opening and then both of these have communication just over you have to go dorsal and medial to the infraorbital canal so you have to come up over that to get to the nasomaxillary opening okay which communicates into the middle nasal meatus notice we have carved out here dorsal to the dorsal limit the osseous nasal lacrimal duct. Okay, both of these structures, the infraorbital canal and the osseous nasal lacrimal ducts, you don't want to trefine into. Okay. So basically these would be the points where you would trefine to get into these sinuses. Primarily this would be done for tooth root abscesses. Okay. Now looking at a radiograph here. I want to point out to you this canal right here, this osseous canal. What is this? Notice about the medial aspect of the orbit is here. So yes, this is the osseous nasal lacrimal duct. And then this structure here. That's right, that is the infraorbital canal. Okay, let's identify these bones on the equine skull. So A, once again, is the incisive bone. B would be the nasal bone. C would be the maxillary bone. D, the frontal bone. E at the medial canthus of the eye would be the lacrimal bone. The bone at F, yep, that is going to be the zygomatic bone. Back here at G, notice that G is also coming into the zygomatic arch, so that is the 
temporal bone. And then up here at H, the parietal bone. And then back the caudal most bone here is the occipital bone. Down here at J, we find the mandible. Yep. And of course, we cannot forget that right here is the facial crest. Okay, something we want to point out to you is that the cheek teeth in horses, they're sometimes referred to as ever erupting. They do have a limit to their eruption, but they start out as very long teeth. So in a young animal, we see that the maxillary sinus contains the roots of premolar four and the first three molars, okay? As those wear down over time, then that maxillary sinus enlarges over time, okay?